morning um, for our Sunday school hour and uh, for, well, for as long as the Lord leads here, but maybe for a couple of months' time on Sunday mornings, we're going to be talking about some of the great journeys of faith that we can see take place in the Bible and, and really considering the topic of faith, which relates to trust in God's Word and just simple obedience to His Word. And some of the great things that were accomplished in people's lives as a result of being willing to follow or, or engage on those specific journeys. So we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 6 this morning, and we're going to be looking at the character Noah. And we'll just be reading a few short verses here about his life and some of the events that led up to um, some great decisions that he made. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on our time here as we study. Our Father, we bow our hearts before you this morning and come um, excited and expecting for you to, to touch our hearts and touch our minds as we study your word. We pray that you'll bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that he will uh, illuminate our minds, help us to understand what we read and study today. And, uh, and as a result, I pray that our lives will be deeply impacted and changed by what we hear. In Jesus' name I pray. All right, so Genesis chapter 6, and let's start in verse 1. It says, It came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became, became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, that grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And then skip down to verse 22. It says, uh, after he received all of God's command building the ark and receiving the animals. Thus did Noah. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. We, uh, we were blessed during our church retreat to enjoy a number of different um, uh, <coughs> Bible lessons and skits that were put on by uh, a lot of our young children. Those of, the, those of you that were there got to enjoy that and participate in it. And then we got to, after they acted it out, we got to guess what it was that they were portraying. It was a lot of fun. Um, this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the concepts, one of the stories that they were portraying. And, um, and we're going to see it reenacted before us from the scriptures today as well. Uh, obedience, a critical topic, and it's one that we're going to see emphasized over and over again in this study not just this morning, but as we continue on in Sunday mornings ahead. Uh, and we look at, again, some of these great journeys of faith that were undertaken by some great men and women of God as they moved at God's command. In, um, in the year 1969, in Mississippi, a town called Past Christian, there were a group of people who were preparing to have what was called a hurricane party. Uh, there was a big hurricane that was on its way into the Gulf Coast, and they were going to have a party during the hurricane. Uh, they lived right on the, the ocean front. Uh, there was a, a hurricane by the name of Hurricane Camille that was on its way in and was going to make landfall shortly. Whether they were ignorant of the dangers that were coming, or they were overconfident, or they were proud, we don't know exactly what it was, maybe they were just stupid. What we do know is that uh, while the, the storm was approaching, <coughs> wind was howling outside uh, this ritzy set of apartments on the ocean front, 
Uh, the police chief from the, from the town there pulled up sometime after dark. Uh, he was on the beach, less than 250 feet from the surf, and the apartments were there right next to him. He was just doing some security checks to make sure that people cleared out of the area. There had been an evacuation order that was given to folks in this particular area where the storm was projected to make landfall. There was a man with a, an alcoholic drink in his hand. He came out on the second floor balcony from this set of apartments. And the police chief, Jerry Peralta, yelled up, you guys need to get out of here as quick as you can. Storm's getting worse. It's going to be even worse than predicted. Other people started to pour out of the apartment and join the man on the balcony, and they just laughed at the police chief and his order to leave. Now, this is my land. They kept yelling, if you want me off, you have to arrest me. Well, there weren't any arrests that were made that night, um, but the chief was not able to persuade them to leave either. He wrote down the names of the people and asked them for the names of their next of kin. Laughingly, they shared the names of their next of kin, and, and the chief left. Uh, they'd been warned, but they had no intention of leaving. At 10.15, just a short time later, within a few hours, the front wall of the hurricane came ashore. Scientists that were monitoring the storm clocked uh, Camille's wind speed at over 205 miles per hour as it made landfall, the strongest hurricane on record. The waves off of the Gulf, Gulf Coast measured between 22 and 28 feet high. Well, the news reports later on showed that the very worst damage came at a little settlement of hotels and bars and gambling houses named, uh, named Pass Christian, Mississippi, uh, and there were some 20 people who were killed at, at a hurricane party in these particular apartments. And nothing was left at all of the three-story structure that they were partying in except the foundation. It was completely obliterated and gone. The only survivor was a five-year-old boy that they found floating on a mattress the following day. You may wonder why people are so foolish as to ignore the obvious signs of coming peril or coming danger. Why did those folks disregard warnings that were so clear and so evident right there before their face? <laughs> you know, people in our day are not a whole lot different than people in Noah's day thousands of years ago, <laughs> refusing to acknowledge sin and refusing to acknowledge the signs of the coming judgment, men and women who lived during Noah's time turned their backs on their Creator. Men and women today have done much the same thing. So in Noah's day, <clears throat> the population was exploding on the face of the earth. The hearts of people were wicked, um, just following their natural tendencies, and yet God uh, designed a, a journey of grace for those who would follow him in complete obedience that would take them to safety and prevent them from having to face tremendous judgment that was on its way, but it was all dependent on their personal response. And so we're talking about some of the journeys of faith, and in this case we're going to talk about the journey to Ararat, all right? Mount Ararat, which is uh, well, does anybody here know the significance of that mountain? What was Mount Ararat? Anyone at all? It's the resting place for the ark. Yeah, it was the, uh, it was the mountain that the ark ultimately parked on. Once the flood was over and the waters receded, that was where the ark ended up landing at. And so it was a place of safety, all right? Again, we're in Genesis chapter 6, and we see this in verses 5 and 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What an incredible evaluation by God. It repented the Lord. That is, he had a, a change of heart. Repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Between the time of creation 
in the time of Noah, we can see very clearly that extreme wickedness had developed on the earth. In fact, um, we'll talk about the, the time chronologically that's passed here in just a moment, but in the book of Genesis, we're only in chapter 6. You know, between chapter the end of chapter 3, when it finished the story about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and... Noah, in chapter 6, and we only have two chapters of the Bible that's passed by. And mankind is already in that period of time degenerated into this level of corruption that God says, there's only one solution. There's no helping these people. I just have to exterminate them. I mean, there, there, there is no bringing them back from this. And so he purposed to destroy uh, the wickedness that he saw with the worldwide flood. God personally examined the hearts of every single person on the earth. And do you know that he found righteousness in only one person? Just one. In the entire earth. It's mind-boggling to me. God decided to send a flood, um, but he still made it very plain that he would save Noah, and he would save all who would heed his warning. Genesis chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 goes on and says, The Lord said, I will destroy both, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And not only did Noah find grace, the Bible tells us later on that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and part of his task, his job, was not just building the ark necessarily, but continuing to preach that message of righteousness and warn people for how many years while he built the ark? Does anybody know? Seven. Seven? It's a little higher than that, actually. That's a good guess, though. A hundred years that it took Noah to build the ark and prepare for the flood. That's a long time, folks. Three generations? Uh, people that could have been born during that period of time. Well, we're talking about the reason for the journey here that God sent Noah on and anyone else who would go with. Well, one of the reasons for the journey we can see very clearly is corrupt hearts. In the beginning, God had created Adam and Eve without sin. I hope everybody here understands that. God created a perfect creation and the holiness that they had and the sinlessness allowed them to enjoy perfect fellowship with God. It was not broken by anything at all. And of course we know the story in Genesis um, chapter 3. Satan, disguised as a serpent, spoke to Eve. He tempted her to disobey God's command. Eve, using her own reasoning and rationale, disobeyed God. And sin. She gave the fruit of the tree that they weren't supposed to eat up to Adam, and he ate of it, and it was an intentional disobedience, disobedience on his part as well. Now, because of their choice to sin and disobey God's very clear and explicit command, they experienced spiritual death, losing their fellowship with God, being separated from God from that point on. Now, after Adam and Eve fell from grace, fell from the, the glorious position that God had created them in, and they fell into sin, the population of the world began to multiply rapidly. That was part of God's command anyway, was to multiply and replenish the earth. <clears throat> and the inward and habitual sinfulness of man multiplied just as rapidly as the population did. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 made a remarkable statement. It says that every, don't miss the wording, every imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. I mean, that shows a people that is completely and wholly invested in nothing but sin and debauchery. The word from the Hebrew for imagination here. Um, it, it, it actually is typically used to refer to fashioning pottery, all right? the, the fashioning of something. It is speaking of that which is shaped or fashioned. So as people intentionally gave their time and they gave their energy and they gave their thought to things, it was just to fashion evil 
only, constantly. And, and to them, what was fashionable was wickedness. Uh, that was the thing of the day. It was what was not just accepted, but loved and appreciated by all. The people of Noah's day were truly corrupt and abominable. The psalmist describes that type of mindset in Psalm 14 and verse 1. It says this, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. In just a, a little less than 2,000 years time, about 10 generations total, all of humanity had become corrupt before God. God had become so grieved with the prevalent wickedness of man's heart that he purposed to destroy the world in this flood. And so we can see the reason that God sends Noah on this journey in the first place was corrupt hearts. And the further purpose was corrupt lives. And the reality is this, that a corrupt heart will always produce a corrupt life. And that was the case in Noah's day, it's the case today. Sin was rampant for them. It had become accepted. It had become even fashionable to participate in many of these activities. There seemed to be no limits, no restraints to how far wickedness would take people. During Noah's time, sin went from being exceeding, exceedingly repulsive to being tolerated and accepted and promoted. And that's a, a, a degeneration in culture that we can see, not just in Noah's day, but in our day as well. Luke chapter 17 and verse 26 says this, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus said that. Today we're living in a world in which so much is built around fleshly pleasures and evil desires. Believers in Christ even have become accustomed to the sin that's around them. Some believers have become accepting of it and even promoting it. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, there is a, an amazing statement that's made there, but in talking about the corruption of society and talking about people that participate in that corruption, it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. There is an active promotion of this and even a taking of pleasure in the wickedness that God condemns when they see it in the lives of other people. Noah's, um, Noah's righteousness that's contrasted with that very clearly condemned the wicked world that was around him. Noah's example of obedience to God as he found grace in the eyes of the Lord and then engaged to do differently is so clearly contrasted against the folly, the foolishness of this world's wickedness. Now by Noah's obedience, their disobedience was exposed for what it was. Noah's holy life was an indictment of the sinfulness around him. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It should be that way. What kind of an example are you to those around you? As you live in a corrupt and wicked world and you claim to be a follower of God, are you a person who is bringing conviction to the lives of other people by your consistent godly living? Noah did. Noah was no doubt mocked and scorned for it. May we never grow accustomed to the blatant sinfulness of our day. It's not something that we should tolerate. It's not something that we should be okay with. It's not something certainly that we should ever participate in or promote. God help us to strive to live holy lives in the midst of a perverse and wicked culture. We need God's help to do that. It is possible that we can do that. And so that's the reason for this, this journey that God sent Noah on. Well, secondly, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that's, that's 
very, very important. It's very important in the life of Noah, and that is his readiness for that journey. All right? The greatest decision of Noah's life was not his decision to build the ark. That wasn't it. It was his decision to walk with God. We see that stated clearly for us in the text. Before God can use you greatly, He must prepare you greatly. And you must prepare yourself greatly. Noah was a man who was prepared and ready for an assignment from God. He had pre-positioned himself to be ready to receive that, that assignment. He developed a true relationship with God that prepared him for the journey of faith on which he would embark. He was ready because of his walk with God. Think again on Genesis 6, verses 8 and 9. This is what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. And, and before it even tells us, do you know that there's something very important that's stated here? Before it even tells us who his descendants were, who his generations were, Noah was a just and a perfect man in his generations. Noah walked with God. While the world was only wicked continually, Noah was walking with God consistently. Contrary to the culture of his day, Noah chose to cultivate a personal relationship with God by walking daily with Him. And Noah's life was transformed into one of exceptional character that prepared him for this critical journey to Ararat. Are you walking daily with the Savior? Are you walking with Him? Are you purposely, purposefully developing an intimate relationship, a meaningful relationship with Him? John chapter 15 addresses this. Jesus said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Abide, that means to stay permanently. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. You know, worshiping God is not just something that Noah did on Sundays. It's not just something that he put on a few times a week when he was around other godly people. It was a part of his daily life. Hour by hour, moment by moment, this is what characterized Noah. He walked with God. <laughs> that, that, of all statements, is what characterized his life. God did not choose Noah to build the ark because of the things that he did for him. He chose Noah to do this because of what he was in his character, in his daily life. Now, a Christian's life is not measured by how much he does, or she does, but how much they are. We need to determine to be something before God. Before attempting to do things for God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to be something for Him before we do things for Him. And we prepare ourselves for the Master's use through cultivating a walk with Him. And so Noah was ready, we can see here, because of his walk. He was also ready because of his will. Some choices of his will. Genesis 6.22 that we finished with, it said, Thus did Noah. Those are choices that are made. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. All that God commanded. God honored Noah because of his obedient spirit. He was a man who practiced daily obedience before God. When God told Noah to build the ark, there was no question that he would obey. Now, this was something, again, that was mocked and scorned by everybody else. There had never even been rain on the earth, and God's prediction here was it's going to rain. And so it, it was just a mockery to everybody else. It could have been to Noah too. He could have questioned or doubted because he'd never seen rain before and he had no reason to expect it other than God said it's going to happen. Well, when he heard this, he immediately moved. There was no question that he would obey. He had determined to respond to God in all things. Now, obedience to God was 
Not a decision for Noah that had to be made every time a new situation arose. He had decided early in life to obey God. Roger Staubach was a, uh, a, a world-class uh, quarterback. He played for the Dallas Cowboys back in their world championship days in the early 1970s. In 1971, he admitted that his position as quarterback of that star team, um, who didn't get to call his own signals, his own play calls, was really a source of struggle for him. His coach during those days, Tom Landry, <coughs> sent in every single play to him. He told Stavok when to pass, when to run, and only in dire emergency situations was he allowed to change the play. Now, even though he considered Coach Landry um, to have a, a genius mind, he says, that's his own quote, when it came to football strategy, his pride said that he should be able to run his own team. Well, Roger Staubach later said this, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. If we want harmony, fulfillment, and victory in our lives, we need to learn to obey as well. It's as simple as that. God wants us to obey His Word. He wants us to have hearts that are already predisposed and determined to obey no matter what the command is that comes along. God puts His finger on your life and tells you, I want you to do this. I want you to give your life in service for this. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a missionary. We need to be ready to just obey and say, okay, go ahead and take me. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is clearly laid out before us. And as we allow his word to illuminate our steps along the way, God will guide and direct us. We can be sure of that. The word of God is reliable. It provides answers for those uh, around us. That, that may even mock us for what we're doing. Again, Noah suffered reproach for obeying God, but he faithfully continued to obey God out of a heart of reverence, out of a heart of fear for him, out of a heart of trust. And so Noah's will was bent towards obeying God. He was a man who was prepared for the journey because, um, because he, his will and because of his walk with God. And then the results of the journey are very clearly laid out for us. You probably all know the story of the flood that came. And the reality is this, that God's holiness demands judgment upon sin. He always provides a way of escape, though. Always. Even when judgment is surely coming on our lives as a result of our sin, and we can be guaranteed from the scriptures and from our own conscience that there's a judgment coming, and that there's the judgment of hell that's coming even for us if our sins aren't properly addressed, God always provides a way of escape. It was the same in Noah's day. Noah told other people about the coming, of, the coming flood. He pleaded with them to repent, but they would not. The people in Noah's day chose to ignore God's warning. They chose to ignore the witness of God through Noah. And the flood destroyed all of human life that was not safe in the ark. But, you know, God did not end the human race forever at that point in time. There was one righteous man. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah's decision to build and enter the ark was instrumental in the preservation of the human race. If he had refused to obey God, the results of this entire journey would be drastically different. So we can see there was a preservation of human life. In Genesis 6.14 it says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark. And shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And then in chapter 7 and verse 1 it says, The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now God's grace was clearly displayed to everyone who lived during Noah's time. It was offered to everyone. It was seen in the warning about the coming flood. It was seen in his invitation to join Noah on the ark. 
And it was seen in his provision of a way to escape that judgment. Unfortunately, only Noah and his family decided to obey God. And because of this, they were safe in the ark. The reality is this, when you and I follow God in complete trust and obedience, we can rest in the safety that he provides. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 are some scriptures that you would do very well to memorize and recall the memory often. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Well, Noah was secure in the ark. In Genesis 6 and ver or 7, verse 16, uh, chapter 7, verse 16, it says, And they that went in, went in male and female, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut the door to the ark. What a comfort it must have been to Noah and to his family to have God shut the door and to seal it up. He and his family must have experienced the safety and security of God in a very special way as a result of that. And today, in a day when... Um, there is much cause for great insecurity in the world around us. We can trust in the security of our God as well. Just as God did with Noah, he'll preserve us and keep us safe and take care of us as we follow his will. And so um, the, the, the outcome of this journey, where well, we can see that there was a preservation of the human race. There was also a preservation of the faith. Did you know that? In Genesis 6 and verse 9, again, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. I mentioned already to you that the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Now, although only his family chose to heed the warning that God gave, Noah still proclaimed the truth of the coming judgment. In fact, let me read it to you in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. It says that God spared not the old world, but he saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God offered this same journey of grace to those who would follow him out of a heart of belief. The wicked lineage that's mentioned in our passage here in Genesis 6 had spread throughout the entire world. But Noah was perfect in his generations. And so God designed a way for Noah and the people of his day to escape the coming judgment. In Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 14, it says this, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Speaking about the wicked world that they lived in. God will preserve those who walk in his way. And by sparing Noah and his family, God preserved the faith. We're talking about the truth for future generations as well. And that was something that continued on in Noah's family because of how important it was to him. And one more thing that God preserved is that he preserved the gospel. Not only did God preserve the people or humanity, and he, and he preserved the faith of Noah, he preserved the gospel. This biblical account of Noah and the ark provides a clear picture and a clear example of salvation, doesn't it? I mean, if you know anything at all about the gospel message and God's desire to save the world from the coming judgment on sin, this story here clearly illustrates it. Noah preached faith in the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, it says this. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, that is, he moved with reverence, he moved with trust, and he prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah condemned the worldliness of his day, and in choosing to believe God, he became an heir of righteousness through his faith. Folks, the ark... That boat that God had him create according to God's own plan and God's own design, it's a picture of our salvation. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, it says this, 
which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And we can see the love of God that's very clearly demonstrated through his long suffering. God was patient with those who would not repent, who would not listen, who would not believe. But once the ark was complete, there was a choice that had to be made in order to be saved. We see that God put in one single door into the ark, and that was the only entrance that there was to salvation and to security. And in the same way, we have to realize there is only one way into heaven John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus said this, I am the door. By me, if any enter in, he shall be saved. And we also see the faithfulness of God in keeping his promise to save us. God is not slack concerning his promise. And we can trust him to take us to heaven when we put our faith in him. And we also see this at the end of the conclusion of the story that God remembered Noah. Genesis 8 verse 1 says this, And God remembered Noah, this is at the end of the flood, and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the, in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged, that is, they receded. And God brought Noah's journey of faith to a safe and wonderful end on the mountaintop of Ararat. We can thank the Lord. We can thank the Lord that when our earthly journey is complete here, He'll remember us and bring us safely home too. Now let me end just by a conclusion, and this is referenced so much through the New Testament as an illustration, as a picture of obedience, as a picture of salvation. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 through 39, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is the return of Jesus. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, the times in which we live are very much the same as the times in which Noah was living for the Lord. There is much that we can learn about Noah's stand for God, about Noah's willingness to be reproached for the truth, about his willingness to stand against a wicked, erring culture and not to become absorbed in it, not become a part of it, but to preach against it. Noah obeyed God completely. He built the ark faithfully day after day after day. He didn't worry about the things that he didn't understand he continued faithfully executing the job that God had given him to do. He didn't refuse to begin until all of his questions were answered. He didn't have to see all the details worked out. He simply followed every instruction that God had given him and left all the rest to God. And as a result, he was a man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What's your spirit like today? What have you predetermined? Have you made the choice to walk with God? Have you made the choice in your will to obey God no matter what He tells you to do? I pray that that will be the case and that each one of us can choose to claim God's promises no matter what happens around us. Well, in reference to that story, Peter writes and he says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise Concerning his desire to bring salvation to our lives, but his long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish. God didn't want anyone to perish in the days of Noah either, but it was a choice they had to make to follow him. He doesn't want anyone to perish today either in the sense of, um, of dying in their sins, going out into eternity without Christ. And so his desire is that all should come to repentance. So put that before you today and pray that God will apply it to your life as he sees fit both for salvation and for the importance of choosing in faith to obey him completely and without any questions.
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word this morning. I thank you for this great picture of faith that you've given to us in the life of Noah as he journeyed from, uh, from where he was at in that wicked culture uh, to ultimate salvation through you and then safety and security as he entered into the ark and, uh, and you took them all the way through that flood and through that judgment safely. I pray that each person here have a heart that's both ready and willing to respond to you in faith, uh, absolute trust as we obey and follow your word. I pray if anyone is here today that's not saved, they very clearly would see through this study today the need for salvation and give their hearts and lives fully to you. In Jesus' name I pray. All right, you're dismissed.